Okay, what I want to do here is go through some of the basic terminology and symbols that are involved in hypothesis testing. Now, hypothesis testing is a big topic, and it's it's really more of a concept than one um, particular con one particular topic. And we're going to look at hypothesis testing as of one mean against a number, and then we'll move on to testing two means. We'll also look at proportions. There's lots of different hypothesis tests out there. But really the point is to understand the reasoning behind it. Um, so I'm going to give, give a little bit of analogy in this video. So when we do a hypothesis test, what's going on is, is, is it's often really helpful to compare it to what happens in a courtroom. So first of all, we have this mu. And mu is what we're used to thinking of it being. It's a mean. It's an expectation. It's the mean value for some measurement Maybe it's height, maybe it's weight, maybe it's IQ, maybe it's test score for some measurement um, among a specified population. So we have some population that we're trying to make a conclusion about, and here's the mean measurement for that population. And the population is inaccessible, otherwise we don't need statistics. And because the population is inaccessible, we're going to draw a sample. We're going to look at some of the population, see what happens, and see what kind of conclusion we can draw about the entire population just based on that sample. Now, when I have the mean value for some measurement, this is a theoretical idea. I can't access it. It's there, but I can't access it. It's sort of like the average weight of people in the United States. That is a number. We're fairly comfortable with talking about it. We can't actually measure it, though. We don't know what it is. People are dying and being born all the time, and measuring their weight um, just would not be realistic to measure everybody's weight at the same time. Okay, so what this is analogous to in the courtroom is what actually happened. Okay, what actually happened? When the lawyers are presenting evidence and the jury is trying to consider that evidence you're not able to actually be there and to see and to hear and to smell and to t taste and touch what actually happened instead you act you had to go off of the evidence so what actually happened is what we're trying to make a conclusion about even though it's actually inaccessible and when we're comparing one mean against a value we're going to call that value a so a is a value to which we wish to compare mu. Okay, so if you're looking at IQ scores, usually you'd want to compare the average IQ score to 100 since IQ scores are scaled, so the average is supposed to be 100. Okay, now what this corresponds to in the courtroom is what would have happened if the defendant were innocent? Okay, they always make a big deal in the crime movies. You got to have an alibi. If you're going to commit a crime, you have to have some kind of story that says what you actually were doing that isn't true because you're actually off committing the crime but you have to have you have to come up with a story that has you doing something else that wouldn't allow you to do the crime well a is like the alibi that's saying what would have happened if the defendant were innocent so the h sub zero is called the null hypothesis okay and the null hypothesis is that what actually happened is what would have happened if the defendant were innocent. In other words, it's innocence. Okay. If the actual uh, mean value among the population is equal to this value, then that's what we mean to be innocent. And what do we mean to be guilty? That's called the alternative hypothesis. And that is that mu is not equal to a. Need a colon up here, which is analogous to guilt. Okay. 
Now, how do, we, how do we get at these abstract ideas? These are ideas that we can talk about, but we can never actually access them. We don't know the mean weight among people in the United States, and we can't know it. Okay, and we uh, furthermore, since we don't know it, we can't know if it's equal to uh, say 190 pounds or whatever the we mean weight might reasonably be equal to. The way we try to judge a statement, such as the average weight of, the, of Americans is 190 pounds, is we gather evidence, which is sample data. So the evidence is the sample data. Now that sample data, we're usually going to reduce right down to the sample mean. And sometimes we'll use the standard deviation, sometimes we will not. Okay, so if we wanted to talk about the average weight of Americans, we would go measure the weight of a bunch of Americans. We wouldn't be able to measure all Americans, but if we just got a bunch of Americans, that would give us some information about all Americans. Okay, that's just like if you're in a courtroom, you're not able to be there and uh, experience what happens, but you can use evidence to get a feel for what happened. Okay, maybe there's a receipt from the uh, restaurant that the defendant says they were at at the time of the crime. Okay, that's, that's giving you a little bit of access into what actually happened. It could be that the evidence is misleading, and that's the same with sample data. It could be that when you pick a bunch of people, you happen to pick people that are particularly heavy in the United States. That's something that is just a real risk. Okay, But the evidence is the best we have to go off of. If the evidence is consistent with the null hypothesis, so remember the evidence is the sample data. If the sample data is consistent to the idea that the average among the population is equal to A, then we say that the alternative hypothesis H sub 1, it's also sometimes called H sub A, is the reason I wrote A there. I don't think neither uh, notation is better than the other. I just chose to use H sub 1. H sub 1 is not supported. Okay, so I mean that that's sensical. There's, there's not much hard thinking going on there. If the evidence is consistent with the null hypothesis, then we're not going to support the alternative hypothesis. Since the null hypothesis is the idea of innocent, we're going to look at the defendant as innocent unless proven guilty. We're going to look at this mean as being equal to A unless we have convincing reason to think that it's not equal to A. This is also sometimes said that the null hypothesis is accepted. You can either look at it um, focusing on the, on the alternative hypothesis H sub 1 or the null hypothesis H sub 0. If, on the other hand, the evidence is inconsistent with innocence, with the null hypothesis, then the alternative hypothesis is supported. In other words, the null hypothesis is rejected. We're going to use this terminology that refers to the alternative hypothesis. But you might see the terminology that refers to the null hypothesis in literature, so I want to um, point it out that that is common as well. Okay, so when we're doing a trial, we gather our evidence. When we're doing a statistical test, we gather our sample data. And then we examine that evidence in a trial, and we determine whether or not that's consistent with what would have happened if the defendant were innocent. Whether or not it looks like it's reasonable that, that what happened was consistent with the idea that the defendant is innocent. And then we make, make our verdicts burst based on that. If the evidence is consistent with innocence, then we're not going to support a verdict of guilty. Notice that's how it's phrased, not guilty. They don't say at the end of a trial innocent, they say not guilty. Um, or we could, we could accept this idea of innocence. If, on the other hand, the evidence is inconsistent with innocence, and say, hey, I, I mean, what we see just 
doesn't line up with the idea that you didn't do this crime, then the only reasonable conclusion is that the crime was done by the defendant and that that um, hypothesis is supported. In other words, innocence is rejected. So if we look in terms of the statistical test, we gather sample data and we ask, is this sample data consistent with the null hypothesis? That there's no difference between these two quantities that we're examining. If the evidence is consistent, then we're not going to support that the idea that there is a difference, right? Because the evidence is consistent with the idea that there is not a difference. Uh, you can also say that the null hypothesis is accepted in that case. If, on the other hand, the evidence is inconsistent, for example, if you um, took a bunch of Americans and got their average height and their average was like six foot three or something, right? we know that that's not going to happen based off our experience, but maybe sometime in the future, maybe a thousand years down the road, as if the United States is really going to be around then. But anyway, <laughs> maybe sometime down the road, the, you get a sample of the average height is six foot three that doesn't seem consistent with the idea that the average height in America is five foot eight or five foot nine uh, whichever I was saying earlier so we would reject the null hypothesis and we would actually say that the, this test does support a difference okay so I hope this terminology or this um, talk is going to help you out a little bit there's one last little idea and that is alpha alpha is the level of significance And we're going to talk about that more in the next video. But I want to compare it here to the courtroom idea. And that's this idea of a shadow of a doubt. I guess I should have an A in there. Okay. Whenever a jury makes a decision, they're not asked to be 100% entirely certain. Instead, they're asked to make their decision based on whether they can, whether they can say that the defendant's guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt. Okay, that's not 100% absolute confidence, but it's saying, you know, it just is absolutely, uh, or it's, it's extremely, extremely, extremely unlikely that this defendant did not do the crime. That's when they pronounce guilty. We always have a positive probability that we're going to, in the language of a, um, of a courtroom, we're going to convict an innocent man. Okay, and that's just part of doing a statistical test. There's always that positive probability that we're going to pronounce there being a difference between two values when in fact there's not a difference. And this level of significance is specified when the t statistical s test is set up. Okay, so I hope this video will be helpful to you. I encourage you to come back and look at it after you've been through a few of the hypothesis testing examples and read through the book. Hopefully it'll help you to make sense of all these different ideas and all these different symbols that are being thrown around.